hi everyone thanks for joining in i'm excited to have avril kenny joining me so the second time i'm talking to avril welcome to our group thank you jackie thank you for having me so a little bit about avril um avril grew up on a dairy farm and began work in the tourism industry at a young age she studied education at james cook university before completing a bachelor of journalism at the university of queensland she currently lives in far north queensland with her husband and four children and when not dreaming up stories she can be found nestled in her favourite yellow wingback chair, reading and sipping tea in her library overlooking the rainforest. Her first novel, Those Hamilton Sisters, was released in 2020 and has been published in the UK and Sweden. And The Girls of Lake Evelyn is her second novel, which I can see you've got your one there in the back. And here's my <laughs> copy here. So a beautiful um, cover, like your first Hamilton yeah. Sisters as well. It's very beautiful. So thanks yeah. so much for joining us. Just wondering if you want to start off by telling us a little bit about The Girls of Lake Evelyn. I'd love to. Thanks, Jackie. So The Girls of Lake Evelyn um, opens in 1958 um, in Final Queensland. Um, it begins with a white car um, toiling up the a very curvy, very bendy um, Gillies Highway here in Far North Queensland. Um, behind the wheel is a runaway bride. Um, she's escaping the society wedding of the year in Sydney. Um, the fiance she doesn't love, the mother who wouldn't let her get out of the wedding. Um, she's heading to a lodge in um, rainforest, tucked away in the rainforest, a place she's never been before. Um, and this lodge called Sylvan Mist has been found for her by her um, playboy uncle. So she's going to hide out there and just try and get over the shame of um, of this runaway bride business of hers. Um, nearby is a beautiful lake, uh, a volcanic crater lake. Um, so she'll spend her days swimming the lake and mm -hmm. um, just trying to get a grip on what she wants to do with her life. But there's a mysterious, something really mysterious about this lake. Um, there's some secrets, um, very deep secrets um, to do with this lake. And in the nearby town of Barrington Downs, we have the plucky Josie Monash, who is a dairy farmer's daughter and she's the town's local theatre director. And Josie's out to break a curse hanging over Lake Evelyn um, with this breakout production of hers um, centering on the curse of Lake Evelyn. So together, um, the two young women will meet um, and they're going to work together to break this curse. And mm. there'll be love, lots of secrets coming out, danger, um, and of course, the beautiful landscape of Far North Queensland, which I just love mm. and I've really made a centrepiece in the novel. Mm. And could you tell us a little bit about what the first idea was that you had for the girls of Lake Evelyn? Yeah, so it actually began with that scene I described with mm. this car struggling up this road um, and uh, this beautiful blonde woman behind the wheel and I knew she was escaping the man she didn't love and she was just heading for freedom. Um, it was that scene which I wrote out in its entirety to begin with. Um, and then the plot followed after that. Mm. And um, my secondary character, Josie, just burst onto the scene in the subsequent chapter. Um, but that was actually informed by my childhood. So I um, used to go with my dad on his tour buses. So he was a, he was oh, a dairy okay. Yeah, so he was a dairy farmer and then um, began driving tourism coaches. Mm. And he'd be going up the Gillies Highway um you know it's there it's quite well known here in australia for how many bends and curves there is and of course back in 1958 it was a single lane road mm. um it had a gate at the top and at the bottom and it would only have one direction flow at a time and so my dad would be telling this story while i was up the back of the coach feeling really really ill because there's just so mm. many bends um, and I'd have my face pressed against the window mm. looking down at all these, you know, undulating mountains going down and just how sort of steep it is and frightening and thinking of this single lane road um, and the cars only going in one direction. And that really imprinted itself on my mind. And, you know, I spent so much time in my um, childhood from about the age of eight onwards in dad's buses mm. and learning all about the area. So that was just something that had captured me as a child. And so that's where that scene came from. Mm. And um, the Tablelands was the tour that dad would be heading up for. And that's just an area here in Far North Queensland I love. Mm. You know, it's tea houses and volcanic crater lakes and beautiful fig trees, strangler figs and, um, you know, all this beautiful farmland with dairy farms. So mm. being a dairy farmer's daughter, um, I just love that landscape. Mm. Mm. And what about the era? What made you choose that? 
Well, actually, I mean, I at the moment have a bit of a thing about that just post World War II, 1950s. Mm. I love the, the social constraints on women in the fiction. And I, I want my strong heroines who are breaking out of some of those molds. Mm. But just that tension that's inherent there in that era for women. Um, but I actually, 1958 is a key time because it was just before that road was actually opened up. Oh, they widened. Okay. Mm. Yeah, and so it fits into that. And there's also a mystery at the heart of the story. So it's I had to choose a particular year to fit into time frames mm. for my mystery and my story. Mm -hmm. And we've got quite a few people watching. So just reminding people watching, if you do have a question for Avril, please um, type it in comments and I can read it out. Kelly says she loved those Hamilton girls and she's looking forward to this one. But she's interested to know if you have a favourite character out of both of the books. Mm. I, when I was writing my second book, I was just, I loved Josie Monash, mm. who um, is this, she's quite petite, but she's this huge character. And whenever I was writing her, I felt so full of joy mm. and confidence and just this big, she's, you know, she loves her drama. She's got such dramatic flair. So when I was writing her, she just made me so happy and joyful. But um, whatever character I'm writing at the time, I alternate viewpoints and I feel that I embody the characters and then I'm, you know, I'm on their side. They're mm. my favourite character and their objectives are mine. So, mm. you know, I, I love the strength of some of my characters. I love the vulnerability of others. Mm. And Belinda says um, it sounds fantastic. She also loved those Hamilton girls. And mm. she wonders if the characters in your new books have um, unusual names like they did in the Hamilton sisters. Oh, not quite literary names, I mm. wish. <laughs> um, they, they're Vivian and um, Josephine, and it's Josie. So they're beautiful. I really love those romantic names, particularly names that lend themselves to nicknames. So we've got Viv and Josie. Yeah. Um, and Josephine was actually named after some uh, water, a waterfall here in Far North Queensland, oh. and also in Josephine mm. Falls, and also um, our Joe from Little Women as well. Mm. Okay, yeah. And um, Kelly says she loves how you transport the reader to not only another time but another place and she wonders if you do a lot of research oh that's very kind thank you um i'm lucky to live where i set both my um novels so far so i absorb a lot of the area just through living and breathing mm. it um and you know having traveled extensively as a child through those areas um i certainly do do research from the historical standpoint you know what what it would have been like back in those times um, and I my preferred way to do that um, is reading fiction from the era um, and reading things like um, you know like your mail order catalogues and things that give you that kind of daily insight into mm. the um, places but I mean in far north Queensland there's so many areas that are untouched and unspoiled mm. so I can write about the volcanic crater lakes and they're largely unchanged which we're very thankful for. Mm. And when you've been doing your research is there anything yet that you found that really surprised you? Mm. Oh, I mean, so much about the, you know, the mm. historical side of it. I had learnt a lot about this area in World War Two, for example, um, up on the Tablelands, there was over 100,000 um, Australian and American troops based in the region for jungle training. Um, and my own grandfather was actually based in this area. Uh, he served in New Guinea at the time, as it was called. And um, so I just loved just there's a lot of publications um, put out locally about the uh, wartime history mm. um, put out by the Eachum Historical Society. So I loved reading all those little insights and, you know, how the troops were entertained and and um, yeah, I, mm. I love learning that you can still go out and find little things left in the ground from those mm. times. Mm. And Kelly says she's a huge fan of historical fiction. Um, she wonders if you would write one set during the world, the war years. Mm. I would love to. I I'm, I just adore World War One and World mm. War Two fiction, probably World War Two more. I almost feel daunted to do it because there's so much talent in that area. And I feel like it's having a real moment in mm. fiction. Particularly yeah. you, you go to the bookstore and there's so many, you see that beautiful, the back of the woman and that mm. wartime kind of um, cover. And I, I mean, I feel like it, it would be great to write. Mm. It's very popular, but I almost feel daunted to do it because so many people are doing it so well. Yeah. So, absolutely, yes. Mm. That's an area I... I fascinated by. Mm -hmm. And Belinda wonders, when you start writing, do you always know how your book will end? 
Um, I always know the happy ending that I want to get to yeah. and I know the ultimate fulfillment for my characters, but I let them leave the journey to get there. I I tend to know the secret or the twist mm. in my novel and I sometimes wonder if I'm going to be able to pull that off, which is I find that's the creative magic of writing that I, I know where I want to get and then when it actually all those little ties come together, I yeah, it's mm. not my brilliance that did it. It's some other kind of mm. other world magic you know mm -hmm. and when you were growing up as um becoming a writer something that you always thought you might do absolutely yeah mm. it was my number one thing yeah as mm. soon as i understood what an author was and that there was a person who'd made this incredible you know far away tree book that mm. was it i had to be an author so yeah mm. i made up my mind that was going to be it i remember sitting in class when i was i would have been in about grade one and i was pretending i was sitting at the back of like on the mat thinking um pretending that i was at university learning to be an author oh, so right. it, yeah it was there all the time yeah and everything i did was always with that one you know it was that's where i'm going mm -hmm. so you know when i went to uni and did education it was well i'm going to teach english and i'm going to become a writer in my spare time mm -hmm. <laughs> while i'm a mm -hmm. teacher because i had no clue um you know so and then i went on to do journalism and that was because i wanted to hone my craft so mm -hmm. and you know i had children and i was like okay well that's my other great dream but being an author is is what i really really want to achieve mm -hmm. And I think um, we mentioned you have four children and I'm sure you have a very busy life. Do you structure your day for your writing or how do you go about that? Mm. So I used to write whenever I could, mm. um, when they were little and when they're at home. So I wrote a lot when they napped and I'd have the baby asleep mm. on my chest or I'd write at night time when they go to bed at, you know, 6 p.m. But now mm. that I have teenagers that seem to be up <laughs> until mm. midnight, um, I'm wrecked at the end of the day. I just, I have a lot of extracurricular mum taxi work to mm. do and I get to the end of the day and I'm so tired. I find um, raising teenagers a lot more complex than children. So yeah. I, the beginning and end of the day is just so tiring. So I write in, I'm very lucky to do this, but I write in school hours. Um, but even that feels like life eats into it all the time. So mm -hmm. I try to be at my desk by about um, 9.30. Uh, I should say my laptop desk. And um, I, I try to write through, but I mean, it comes around two o'clock and you have to think about where you're going to get that car park at school. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> yeah. yeah. And are you working on something new at the moment? Mm, I'm working on a third novel. Um, I'm for I'm probably six or seven chapters into it, about twenty thousand words. Um, I'm <laughs> I'm at that stage where I'm I'm feeling like you know worried about third book syndrome. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was worried about second book syndrome, so I'm still at that stage where it's very um you know you feel like you're roller skating for the first time. Mm. And set on far north Queensland again. <laughs> Yeah, it yeah. is. Yeah, I'm, re I'm really mm. excited about the setting of this one. Yeah. Mm, mm, great. And um, Kelly wonders if you could tell us um, any five star reads you've had this year and what um, type of genre you enjoy reading. I read everything and anything. Mm. <laughs> um, oh, I probably don't really like the police procedurals so much. I, mm. I did a lot of those when I was young, all the Patricia Cornwalls and so forth. So I'm, I've moved away a little bit from those, but I'll read, you know, it'll be a classic one week and then I'll be reading um, a nonfiction. I read uh, always a nonfiction at the same time as a, um, a fiction. Um, I probably would say five star reads this year. I loved The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue. Oh, yes, um, yeah. Apples Never Fall. Mm. Um, Mm, they were my five star reads, I think. Mm. Um, I was this tender land. Um, yeah, they were big ones for me. I love a story that just the setting, everything draws you in, and you're in some other world. And where, particularly when the writing is just really beautiful. Mm. So, um, I've had a lot of people recommend Crawdads to me based on that criteria. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got yeah. that one lined up. <laughs> yeah, and the movies out for that one as yeah. well. So yeah. And when you're writing, do you find you ever have writer's block? And if you do, what do you find you do that helps you? Mm. Um, probably by virtue of having, you know, only set time that I can mm. madly write away. I don't really get writer's block. I get um, writer's second guessing. <laughs> I'll, I'll really second guess what I have written um, and worry that it's not going to, as I said, bring all those ties together. And um, if I'm feeling I can't muddle out a conundrum, I'll go for a run or a ride. Mm. And that, that's to just get things flowing, both physically, mentally, spiritually, mm. everything. Um, mm. Generally, if I'm not 
not thinking directly about the problem and I'm not looking directly at that problem. As long as I'm moving, I can, the voices will come into my head and there'll be a conversation I'm listening into and I'll go, oh, okay, that's it. Mm. Yeah. And Alison says she loved your new book. She finished it today. And she's um, thinking maybe a continuation of the story in the future. She'd love to hear how everyone's story continues. Yeah. Oh, I love hearing that. Yeah. I, I really want to leave that people wanting to know more about their lives. I feel that's a satisfying thing for a writer, even if it's not for the reader, <laughs> wondering what happened. But, you know, I love my happy endings and I, I want people to feel that, you know, you've made a new friend in those characters and you want to know what happens. I haven't got any plans to continue either of my novels yet. Mm -hmm. um, I had started writing a sequel to my first novel, but... Okay. Um, really depressing oh, okay. <laughs> and then it just, and the, there's something there that's just not it's like a the magic just went mm -hmm. and all of a sudden like, there was nothing to follow there was no more talking in my mm -hmm. head and I couldn't continue writing it mm -hmm. so we've shelved that one mm -hmm. and what have you found so far to be your favorite part of the publishing journey um holding the book yeah <laughs> yeah like actually I see when that what beautiful covers you have for both of your books no, there so this is the work of Louise Imaggio in Australia mm. and um, she just the way she does it it's I mean it's Australian it's mm. so realistic and um, the colors it's always so vibrant mm. so I yeah I really and love did the she, was it the same person who did your first book as well yes it was yeah. and so it's got the same you know yeah the same and you know mm. I I just love it mm. <laughs> absolutely and the bright pink color the yeah. um, spine yeah. Um, no, yeah, no, it's holding the book. That's my favourite part of it. Um, mm. Probably my least favourite part is the first draft. Um, I love writing. I'm not someone who says I don't like writing, but it's until like I really have finished that draft and know it works. Mm. Um, it's that low level anxiety there all the time of can I pull it off? Is it going to come together? Mm. Mm. And when you are writing, do you have a favourite snack or drink? Lots and lots of tea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, lots of tea, sweet, milky tea. Um, mm. I, I also drink coffee, so I'm very well caffeinated. Um, no, I love something sweet to eat, actually, um, or I'll mm. get like a big bowl of veggie chips um, and just when I need to crunch something, when I'm mad. Mm. <laughs> um, but, yeah, no, I, I love to eat. And, and actually, if you could see my laptop right now, there's a bit of crumbs on it. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I'm um, sticky fingers all the time but yeah lots of tea mm. and are you in the room now where you would write i write wherever so this is um, my library mm. um and i will sit just opposite here on my yellow wing back chair which you mentioned before mm. because then i can look out at the rainforest i've got big bifold windows here um door that pulls back um, and so we've had really bad mosquitoes um, this year due to oh. the strange wet season. Mm. So I've had to have the door mostly shut, but I love to have it open um, so I can hear the rainforest. And there's just this beautiful, cool um, air that comes off the rainforest that's really beautiful. Mm. But I mean, I'll write at the table. I write in the car a lot while waiting for children to come out. Mm. Um, and I also do a lot of um, pre-writing in a notebook. So I'll, I'll just scribble away little bits of dialogue and things that come to me. And then also on my phone, the notes out it ends mm. up being this you know endless scroll because i'm constantly writing little i'll stop in the middle of running and just be bent oh, over gasping yeah you know, typing in my notes up yeah and have you found the second novel harder or easier than the first novel to write um harder because of the pressure i put on myself mm. so i set out thinking well i'm bound to have second book syndrome um I, I felt like there's no way that i can after spending almost 15 years working on the first novel mm. how can i get this out in a year to deadline mm. um i thought well i used up all my good stuff in my first book and there can't be any plot left in me um so there was that pressure mm. and um the first probably well, 10 to twenty thousand words was just all this insecurity and feeling terrible and then i had to really go back to the drawing board um, because it wasn't working I didn't have my heart in it I think I was too I was too busy worrying about the writing rather than just letting the story breathe and actually be alive and I hadn't put my heart in it so once mm -hmm. I really it's like a an opening up your heart feeling like you become really vulnerable and once I was able to do that um, it just really started to flow mm -hmm. and then in terms of writing I, because it was my first year where I had all my children at school and mostly not at home due to the pandemic mm. and by that stage, I was able to um, like really just knuckle down mm. and, um, and and write without all that constant, what can I eat? There's no food, there's mm. no food. <laughs> yeah. 
Mm. And do you do anything special to celebrate when you finish your book? Hmm. Most, mostly when I've had a really big moment, I'll go for a run, which sounds really strange. <laughs> but um, it's how I, like when I get that really high adrenaline, I actually have to run it out. Um, but obviously I love to, you know, pop the champagne or pour the pink gin to celebrate mm. um, and, you know, maybe go out to dinner or something like that. But mm. yeah. Mm. And when you're writing, are you someone who likes to share as you write, share your ideas or sound off ideas to other people? With my first book, it was all 100% secret all the time. The thought of anyone ever knowing what I was writing was just, I'm not, you know, when I do creative writing at university, I hated going to shoots and having to share what I'd written. I really don't like that. Yeah. Um, and so I kept it all quiet. And then my husband was my first reader when I first printed that very large manuscript out. And um, I really enjoyed his, not surprise, but, you know, he'd always believed in me, but to read it. And then I remember him saying to me, oh, you're going to be a famous author. Mm -hmm. So that was really nice, yeah. you know, to actually have him read it. So, oh, so she's not just sitting there tinkering away. She has yeah. written something. Mm. Um, I've completely lost my train of thought <laughs> now. Oh, and yeah, no, now I actually, because I have an agent, um, I do obviously share that. And um, mm. when I'd done my first manuscript, I had... Um, readers early readers and so they read it in that early stage but now that i had that shorter year time frame i didn't have time for that yeah. so my agent is the one who'll see the early chapters and tell me when i've got you know cardboard characters and things mm. that are just when my heart's not in it and she can pick those things and i do have mm. a very loyal reader kate who will read everything and i bounce ideas off her all the time mm. so she's great because she tells it like it is and mm. she's very funny and <laughs> can't get anything past her mm. so mm. And Belinda wonders, how do you feel after spending so long on a novel, hearing that some readers read it like in a day or two? <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's really funny. Although when I had to do my final, final proofread, um, I read it in a day. I think I read it overnight mm. for that final read. Um, so I, that was my first time reading it really, not fast, but reading it through as one whole. So I mean, I understand how, but to me, yeah, it's when, when I know mm. someone's reading it and it takes them three weeks to get back to me on it, I, I like that because I feel like they're savoring it. Yeah. Um, mm. I want them to both want to rush through it, but also want to make it, make mm. it last. And mm. I try to, there's a lot of detail in the book and the language um, can be quite evocative. So I love to know that someone's also savoring it. So yeah. I want you to get to the end and love <laughs> it, but I also want you to savor it. Yeah. Yeah. And Kim wonders if you read your reviews. No, I actually don't. I Well, I do read the ones that are sent to me and mm. um, I have the most lovely um, bookstagrammer um, contacts on Instagram who will review and they'll tag me in it. So I get to read their lovely words. Um, and my my reader, Kate, will send me reviews that she really loves. Um, I'll get my review firsthand from my family and my husband. But no, mm. I don't go and read them mm. because it's... You know, I get enough lovely positive reviews sent to me as it is. So, yeah. and I think if you're there watching some kind of metric, like a star thing, and you know, that's, you're only going to be sending your own head a bit mm. crazy. Mm. Mm. Well, thanks so much for talking to me. Um, it's great to be able to talk to you for a second time about um, sisters of the, sorry, the girls of Lake Evelyn after previously yeah, no. talking to you about Hamilton's sisters. Yeah, and I think I was talking about the book I was writing at the time. So, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. To be here. so it's good to it's talk so, to you again. It's such a pleasure to be here. I really love what mm. you do. Thank you, Jackie. Thanks. And just wondering if you want to tell people watching how they can keep up with what you're doing. Yeah, that'd be good. Um, so I'm on uh, Avril Kenny Author on Facebook. I am Sunshine in a T, oh, sorry, um, Avril Kenny Author on Instagram. And I also have avrilkenny.com, which is my website and a blog that I sometimes update. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much. And thanks to everyone who joined in on the questions. Thank you, Jackie. Thanks. Bye, everybody.